The city of Bradburton is a sprawling tourist town northeast of Nuka World. Its namesake is the CEO and founder of Nuka Cola, John Caleb Bradburton. It likely also served as a home for Nuka World employees. In this regard, it's similar to the designs Walt Disney had for Epcot Center and the Magical Kingdom. Walt Disney originally wanted to make a working town of tomorrow. Even on his deathbed, he used the ceiling tiles above him to map out town districts, sewers, and plumbing pipes. Of course, this is a big, exciting project for us, too, you know. I mean, in fact, it's the uh, biggest thing we've ever tackled. But for Walt Disney, this remained an unrealized dream. Many years after his death, the Walt Disney Company created Epcot, which retained many of his ideas about keeping Disney at the forefront of technology and showing off the world of tomorrow. But Epcot is now a theme park, not an actual town. The closest Disney ever got was when they founded the town Celebration in 1994, which has a number of shops, restaurants, 106 residential houses, six churches, one Jewish congregation, and it shares a road that goes right into Disney World. However, Celebration is not home just for employees, and though founded by the Disney Company, it is still a town in Florida in Osceola County. Celebration, or Walt Disney's unrealized town building plans, are likely the inspiration for Brad Burton. However, the Brad Burton we find in Nuka World is very different. On the outskirts of Brad Burton are two houses. One is a completely wrecked, large, manor style house. This is a random encounter hotspot. It's really close to the Red Rocket Nuka World truck stop. You will likely find battles going on here between the Nuka World Raiders and other enemies in the game, super mutants, or even gunners. There's a pool in the back, the ruins of what might have been a hot tub, and not much else besides the corpses of the enemies you kill here. The next big building on the outskirts is strange. I'm gonna call this Cat Mansion. Here we don't find any people, and instead we find two cats. Vats tells us that the cat's names are Katana and Luna. In a cage in the back of this little shack is a place for one human to habitate. Next to a chair is a locked wooden crate with some chems and some mines inside. And on the box is some moldy food, some yarn, and a picture of a cat. Note that this is clearly an inversed situation. Instead of the cats being in the cage, the human is in the cage, complete with food set out for the human. This might at one point have been a barn. We find a stall, maybe for Brahmin. Inside is a trough with a first aid kit. And there are a few cat bowls in here. Note that they're set to owned, which is strange. Behind one of the walls, next to some rolled up chicken wire, is a cap stash. And under the desk, we find a lunch pail with some random loot. That's about it here. There's another big cat picture on the wall. It's a little mansion for cats with a tiny cage for a human, but no bodies or skeletons inside. Zooming in, we can inspect three major points of interest. In the outskirts up a hill is the Morton residence. When you come up to a explore it, the Morton residence is a big boarded up house and it's a large house. There are some plants growing in a tiny farm outside and you can go all around the house but you can't get in. Peering through the window, however, we do see a suit of power armor inside. So there's got to be a way inside. However, if you try the garage door, you find that it's chained from the other side. To get inside, we drop down the retaining wall just in front of the house. Here we find a pipe with a small pool of water outside. Going through the pipe leads us into the basement of the Morton residence. Here we find a skeleton on the bed. Maybe this is Morton himself. I have to turn off my flashlight here because this is a really pretty scene. There's a light red glow coming from the only lit lamp and the skeleton is holding a Nuka-Cola Quantum. The lighting is just great. In the nearby curio cabinet, we can loot quite a stash of Nuka-Cola. On the ground, there are a few bottle caps 
traps, chems on his bedside table, and a radroach will appear. But we will see many more of these. We can loot the Nuka Cola from his hand and then open a nearby safe with some candles on it for the randomized loot inside. Once we go up the stairs, more radroaches appear from nowhere. We have to deal with them. Finally, at the very top, we can loot the power armor in the frame. However, in my game, something strange happened. I actually got a Brotherhood of Steel Mark IV T60C left leg. This is the first time I've seen a Brotherhood of Steel piece of armor show up in a randomized power armor frame. This might be an oversight on Bethesda's part. It's unlikely that good old Morton, even if he owned a suit of power armor, maybe because he was a military member before the war, had it all painted up with Brotherhood of Steel colors. An organization that wouldn't exist for many years after his death. Once done, we can unchain the garage door and that leads us outside. The next big item near Brad Burton proper is the North Point Reservoir. This is a large dam. Now a tiny lake has formed outside the dam. It may be that J.C. Brad Burton built this large dam to dry out the land so he could build Nuka World. However, in the 200 years after his death, some water has returned. Maybe it's groundwater that has seeped up top from the water tables beneath the earth because we don't see any cracks within the dam itself. Now this reservoir is guarded by many Mirelurks. They're feasting on Bromelof corpses. They have lain their eggs everywhere. And we find quite a variety. We can kill Mirelurk hunters, half a dozen Mirelurks. And once all the Mirelurks in this northern portion of the pond are dead, a Mirelurk queen emerges from the depths and attacks. On the eastern shore of this tiny lake is a rowboat. Inside the rowboat, we find a combat shotgun lying on top of a duffel bag, a cap stash in the bottom of the boat, and a male skeleton. This lake was here before the bombs dropped, so my original theory was incorrect. Groundwater didn't seep on up here. This pond was here originally. Unless, maybe these skeletons belong to people who arrived, say, a hundred years after the bombs dropped. On the far end of the boat, we find a female skeleton, and floating in the water, Water is another male skeleton in a life ring. In the very bottom of the boat, we get a Nuka Cola Quartz. There are Mirelurk eggs all over. You're gonna spend quite some time killing Mirelurk hatchlings just to loot all of these eggs, but it's worth it because you can cook them up into Mirelurk egg omelets, which are gonna be some great experience. There are two shacks nearby. On the outside of one, we see a sign that says, Restricted Area, Unauthorized Persons Keep Out. So this wasn't a home for one of the employees or managers. This must have been an operations building. This is confirmed by the various work desks inside. Maybe this was used by people who were dealing with wastewater management or making sure that the dam correctly held back the water. Next to this shack is another, but it's completely closed off. There are just a couple of dumpsters outside. But behind it is a road that goes all the way up on top of the dam. Now, if you go from the left side, but hug the southern portion of this road, you can make it up on top of the dam despite the frequent messages that say you cannot go that way. From atop the dam, we can look out over Nuka World and it is quite a sight to behold. However, the strange thing is that there's not a lot of water on the other side of this dam. So what exactly is this dam holding back? Perhaps the water has all seeped away over the past 200 years. This dam, however, is right on the border to Nuka World, so as we continue to walk, we keep getting a message saying, we cannot go that way, we cannot go that way. You can kind of finagle your way to the other side if you have a jetpack, and then finally you can pass the final gate to hop on down if you want. But there's no loot up here, no reward for doing so. The dock and other rowboats piled up on top of each other are more hints that this lake has been here since before the bombs dropped, but it may have been quite larger. If you follow the small lake, it goes all the way to the walls of Nuka World where it stops, but you find lakes like these spotted all over the Nuka World Park. In this lake, we find a refrigerator with some loot inside next to a dirty mattress, the corpse of a raider, which is actually a lure. As soon as we get close, we have to kill a Mirelark hunter. 
It's interesting that the Raider Corpse does not belong to a Nuka World Raider, but just your regular, average, run-of-the-mill Raider. Next to his body is a wooden crate with chems and explosives inside, and then a nest of Marlark eggs. So now that we've explored the outskirts of Brad Burton, we can focus on Brad Burton proper. As you walk north up the road, we reach the first residential houses. These are on the southern end of the town. These houses are all boarded up except for one, the middle one, and inside we see an interesting scene. We find find airplane seats set out like a theater with a skeleton and a Jingles the Moon Monkey in the audience. There's a podium up front, and then we find a burning pile on the ground with a sword sticking out of it. If we kindle the fire, the sword ignites and stim packs fall from the sky. And if we take the sword, we see more stim packs fall from the sky. This confused me at first because I honestly don't play a whole lot of other games, but fans have told me that this is an obvious call out to a game called Dark Souls. In that game, you can find big piles like this that if you activate, will restore your health. Looks like Bethesda likes Dark Souls and decided to give them a little homage in this Easter egg. I'm just happy about the stim packs. In the very foreground, we find the church. This church is actually non-functional. There are no doors. You can't go inside. It's just a big boarded up building. I walked all the way around and all I saw was a picnic area behind the church. North of the church along the road are some bus stops. These bus stops likely picked up employees who lived in the area and brought them to Nuka World for work. It's also possible that this town was a tourist destination because we find a gift shop in here and we find a terminal talking about how to deal with customer parking. So it may also be true that the buses picked up visitors from Nuka World and brought them here to explore JC see Brad Burton's great social experiment, the town of Brad Burton. With the periphery of the town explored, we can focus on downtown Brad Burton. As expected, there are a number of residential houses. These likely belonged to employees of Nuka World. In the middle of town, we find a rather regal looking building. This is probably a mayor's house. Directly next to it is a tower labeled Foodstuffs. I'm guessing this is a supermarket of some kind. Next to the mayor's house is a police station. The large brick building with the Nuka-Cola billboards on it is actually a pharmacy. It's a large building to be a pharmacy, and the tiny building next to it is a floats shop. You could come here to get yourself a big old root beer float. The brick building with the fire escape outside is the bank. You can't enter this building, it's all boarded up. The building directly west of it is a motel. This gives us more evidence that visitors to the park would come here to stay in Bradburton. Behind the motel is the Nuka World gift shop. This is where we find the only working terminal in Bradburton. West of the gift shop is a playground for kids with a nice little patio for parents to eat and have a picnic while watching their kids play. The tiny house north of the picnic area is the residential house where we find the corpse of Rachel. I'll talk more about her when we find her body. The tiny house just south of the large pharmacy has a broken for rent sign outside, so I'm assuming this was a house for rent. And in the far northwesterly portion of the town, we find a rather large house with a graveyard in the back and a carport in front with a wrecked car and some tool chests to loot. Now that we understand the lay of the town from a bird's eye view, we can explore it more closely. Heading up the road from Nuka World, the main road goes right into town, but we're actually going to take the right dirt road so that we can explore the gift shop first. The gift shop has a whole bunch of brain fungus outside the door, and it still has a working door. Outside, we see the words gift shop and a bunch of for sale and information signs. As with many of the locations here in Nuka World, there is plenty of Nuka Cola to loot, but this building is unique because it has the little Nuka gift shop terminal. It's locked with a novice lock, which is easy enough to pick, but once you pick it, we can learn a little bit more about what went on here. The first thing we see is all sales are final. Absolutely no refunds. This makes me think that visitors to Nuka World would often return with buyer's remorse. This little gift shop had new products for sale. The manager of the store wanted to make sure that the employees pushed these new products hard. She gave out a $5 gift card bonus to whomever sold the most. They were selling a small cappy ashtray for 20 bucks, a large cappy ashtray for 30 bucks, and then Cappy's candy cigarettes for $5 a pack. Most disturbingly, at the very end, we see a note that says that they sent a letter to the Nuka-Cola Corporation asking if there was any nicotine in the candy cigarettes, and Nuka-Cola did not respond. 
<laughs> which means that there was likely nicotine in these candy cigarettes for children. Ah, oh, that's horrible. The manager ends by saying, please do not call attention to this while speaking with customers. What's also interesting about this is that in the Fallout world, they had gift cards. What? So gift cards work by having a magnetic strip on them, which contains information including the remaining balance of the gift card. First of all, $5 is hardly a realistic amount for a gift card, not only in our world, but especially in the Fallout 4 world, which suffers from high inflation. I, I don't know the math offhand, but $5 in the Fallout 4 world is like 50 cents or something like that, because inflation in the Fallout 4 world was ridiculous. So number one, having a gift card for something worth 50 cents is silly. And number two, I'm a little confused about the technology. If they have gift cards that have magnetic strips, then that must mean that they must have card readers in this world. But I was always under the impression that the pre-war Fallout 4 world didn't really develop that kind of technology, which is why we find everything using cathode ray tubes. I mean, the most advanced computers that we find in this game are from Robco, and they can barely play 8-bit games like Red Menace. But maybe I'm overthinking this. Maybe the cards functioned like IOUs. Maybe it just said, five dollars on there and they could exchange the card for five dollars at any rate the terminal continues with more information about this gift shop. They have a section called Discount Reminders where they talk a little bit about off-site parking. A man named Joe Johnson, likely a local farmer, has allowed the town of Bradburton access to his land for off-site parking. However, it's not free. Parking is $15 an hour. Remember what I said about crazy inflation in this world? It's a completely grass lot. There are no stripes. Neither Joe nor Nuka World are responsible for lost damage or stolen goods. However, they do provide 24-hour towing for those who get stuck, maybe because this land was a former swamp or something. There is a whole lot of water sitting around the land in this world. And the parking lot is only a 10-minute walk away from the bus stop. Buses arrive every 15 minutes. There must have been a lot of bugs nearby because Joe says that people who park there should probably bring bug repellent. So buses would travel between Brad Burton and Nuka World at a rate of every 15 minutes. That's pretty impressive. Anyone who's ever used the bus system before will know that waiting 45 minutes to an hour for your bus to arrive is actually quite common. They must have had quite a few tourists who either stayed at the motel here at Brad Burton or wanted to explore it and buy from the gift shop. We also learned that the gift shop gave Nuka World ticket discounts to patrons who purchased $50 or more in merchandise at the gift shop. We also learned that Nuka Cola had a policy where you could exchange Nuka Cola bottles for $15 off Nuka World admission. The manager of this shop wanted to make clear that their shop did not honor this, that that was a promise from Nuka World, and this shop is separate from Nuka World. They do not accept the bottles. If people want to turn in those bottles, they have to go to Nuka World itself. But they do offer Nuka World ticket discounts for other people. Families of five or more get a 12% discount, but only if they purchase $100 or more. Senior citizens get a 5% discount. Veterans or active military get a discount of 10%. And children under two are, as always, free. They sold t-shirts, which were going buy a five, get one free. They sold visors. If you bought one, you got the second for 50% off. And they gave a 5% discount to batteries if you purchased a product that worked acquired them. The final note is a memo, and here we learn the name of the manager. Her name was Leland, or Leland, and apparently employees were bringing knockoff Nuka-Cola brand items and selling them from this shop. This tells us that Nuka-Cola branded items were seen as very valuable in a pre-war world if people were going to the trouble to make knockoff branded stuff. Leland says that make sure each item that you're selling from this shop has the official Nuka-Cola logo. There are some exceptions to this rule, but if the logo is absent, please see management to get the issue resolved. Now, Brad Burton is filled with all sorts of ghouls. X688 and I just stood here in the street and killed wave after wave of ghouls who came by until their bodies were piled up around us. They came from the buildings. They came from the playground. They came from garbage piles. They came from everywhere. But luckily, they came one at a time. <laughs> Otherwise, it might have been a little bit more tricky. East of the gift shop is the small little playground. We see a spaceship, a swing set, but no corpses or anything else to tell us much of a story. Heading back to the street, we can kill even more ghouls. They just keep coming and coming. 
It makes me wonder if Bethesda used some new rule for Brad Burden, because typically, when you enter a location, you'll awaken all of the nearby ghouls, or the hostiles will become alerted to your presence and they'll all rush you at once. After they're dead, you don't have to worry about it. But here in Brad Burden, we get wave after wave after wave, which is making me think that this encounter might have something unique about it. It may be programmed to generate a new wave of ghouls every 30 seconds or 60 seconds or something like that, until X many waves have gone by, maybe three or four. Because I would explore streets that I had previously explored, and ghouls would find and attack me, but I should have aggroed them the first time I explored the street. It's just something interesting I noticed in this town. In the blue house just north of the motel, we find the corpse of Rachel. On a board near her body is Rachel's holotape. I think this is it. I can't go any further. I can feel it taking me. No, gotta keep it together a little longer. Haswald, I'm sorry. I've looked everywhere I could think, but there's no cure. What towns and outposts I could find said that we ghouls just go feral eventually, and there's nothing to be done. Maybe it was the misters. Held out. As long as I can. I know this isn't what you'd want, but... I can't stand the thought of mindlessly attacking everyone around me. So I've decided to end it on my own terms. I don't know why it hasn't affected you the same, but if you still held it together, I want you to move on. Leave Nuka World. You can still make a life out there. It's not all as bad as we thought. I love you, Oz. This was none other than the girlfriend of Oswald the Outrageous in Kitty Kingdom. She left Nuka World to try to find a cure for being a ghoul. She saw all of her friends in the Kitty Kingdom turn into ghouls and then slowly become feral to lose their minds. After many years, she left the Kitty Kingdom, leaving her lover Oswald the Outrageous behind, and it looks like she didn't get very far. Either that, or she traveled the wasteland for many years looking for a cure, couldn't find one, and so was on her way back when she started to feel herself turn into a ghoul. The change became so powerful that she had to stop here in this house and commit suicide so that she would not turn feral. This also tells us something about ghouls. Any ghoul, even the non-feral ghouls, can at some point turn feral. Here, Rachel was a non-feral ghoul living most of her life as a non-feral ghoul only to turn feral 200 years after she became became a ghoul. Does this mean that Daisy and Good Neighbor could turn feral at some point? Or even Hancock? Could he turn feral? Based on this evidence, it's possible, but I sure hope not. The small residence on the northwestern portion of the town has a carport next to it. In the carport, we find a weapons workbench and a tool chest with randomized loot. Behind the house, we find a small graveyard, and one grave has recently been exhumed. The body of a raider lies with a shovel nearby, and inside the grave, we find a skeleton clutching a cash register with a box of explosives nearby. Is this some sort of social commentary? Is Bethesda trying to tell us that the capitalists here in Nuka World were money-grubbing, even to the point of being buried with cash registers? Are we supposed to see this scene and then question the society within which we live? Maybe, maybe, but I'm going to choose that this man had an unhealthy romantic attachment to a cash register that he probably called Phyllis. If men in our world can pledge their undying love to body-sized pillows with anime girls on them, then I'm sure in the Fallout world, some random disturbed man can fall in love with a cash register named Phyllis. This small graveyard must at one point have been bigger. The land near this house has begun to erode, and in it we find a coffin with a skeleton hanging out of it. I wonder if this small cemetery was for Brad Burton's citizens who died. Either that or it could have been a small family graveyard for the residents of this home. 
Heading down the northern end of Main Street, we pass by a number of wrecked houses. Some of these look a little bit too elaborate to be small residential houses, but they are unmarked. Perhaps we can assume that these were small shopping centers or even a small hotel. I found a strange sight on the side of one of the buildings. It looks like some sort of air conditioning or heating system that apparently is still working, but I don't understand why. We see smoke or steam coming out of the smokestack, and strangely enough, the propeller, which is half buried in feet of mud, is still spinning. I am just guessing that's an oversight. The small alley between the pharmacy and the floats shop appears to be a hot spot for ghoul activity. Walking through this crack, I got attacked by quite a handful of ghouls, and then again in the road right outside. From here, we can take a look at the half-buried foodstuffs building and walk right up to the front of the mayor's house. Right next to it is the police station, but all of these buildings are totally boarded up. Going west from the church, we find a little house with a bunch of explosives outside. On the porch is a bunch of oil which can ignite. Going west along this road to the right, we see the bank with the fire escape outside. There's some brain fungus and trash cans in the alley between it and the motel. The motel has a big motel sign outside, and we can open a red door to enter the first floor. We see some suitcases in the lobby outside. Behind the counter is a cash register and a safe, an advanced lock safe with some randomized loot inside. Heading on up, we can open one of the hotel room doors to find a disturbing scene. And I'm gonna need your help with this because I don't understand it. Here we see three mannequins. All three mannequins are wearing sunglasses and wearing fedoras. One holds duct tape. The other holds a clipboard, and the last one holds a 10 millimeter pistol. Next to the bed is a suitcase. On the headboard is a cymbal clacking monkey, and on the bed is a skeleton surrounded by jet and pre-war money. My gut tells me that this is likely an Easter egg reference to a scene in a movie, but for the life of me, I can't match it to anything that I've seen. In which movie do we find three men in sunglasses and fedoras with a clipboard, a pistol, and duct tape murdering somebody on a bed surrounded by drugs and money with a cymbal clacking monkey? I don't know the answer to this riddle, it's not on the wiki. I couldn't find anything on Google or Reddit, so I'm gonna have to leave this one up to you. Maybe you can answer this question for me. On the porch, we find a bunch of patio chairs and a duffel bag in a bathtub. There are one or two more broken residential houses to explore, none of which have anything interesting in them. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is it. That's the full story of Brad Burton, the Morton Residence, and the North Point Reservoir. They're all a bunch of fun places to explore, inspired by the real world, but filled with their own unique Nuka World Fallout charm. Many people ask me, Oxhorn, is the Nuka World DLC worth it? And I say yes. Even though I liked Far Harbor more, there are still a bunch of fun experiences like this with great places to explore. And for those reasons, I think the Nuka World DLC is worth the cost, even if you don't plan on turning your character into a raider. I didn't. None of my characters are raiders, and I still enjoy the DLC. But what are your thoughts, ladies and gentlemen? I would love to hear your opinions. I read all of the comments you guys leave on my videos, and I use them as inspiration for my future videos. And did you know that I've got a t-shirt shop? That's right, I've partnered with the great guys over at Teespring, and they are working on new t-shirt designs for this community. I've already got a bunch of cool Oxhorn and Fallout 4 inspired t-shirts for sale right now, but the team is working hard on some more that should come out in the next few days. So if you're interested in my shirts, you can find a link to my Teespring t-shirt shop in the description below. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers get access to a private channel on my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.